Baruch Hashem. Let's bless his name together. Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glory is kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, the Yahafta Lorecha Kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are going to sing praises to the Lord as we bless his name. You know, in this season we're in now, Everybody seems to want things to change. What they really want is for everybody else to change. And that doesn't really seem to work real well. So we have to learn how to change from the inside out. And one of the key things to changing is recognizing what needs to change and then asking for God's forgiveness and forgiving others because there is a weight and a, an oppression that is upon people and God wants to remove the shame, remove the guilt, remove all the, those things and God's made provision for us. So we're going to sing this song, Forgiven. And after all, the Messiah paid the price for us, didn't he? So it, it wasn't a cheap thing. It's not just words, it's an action to follow.
It's an amazing thing. And by forgiving others, we can be forgiven. By forgiving others, I can be set free. By forgiving others, I can be forgiven. By forgiving others, I can be forgiven. Forgiving others, we can be forgiven. By forgiving others, the torment is gone. The torment is gone. By forgiving others, we can be forgiven. By forgiving others, we can now move on. So I'm forgiven. And a great weight is lifted. A stone rolled away, forgiven for all the sins I've committed, forgiven of all my guilt and my shame, cause I'm forgiven in your name. Forgiven in your name. Yes, I'm forgiven, and I will never be the same. No more guilt and no more shame. No excuses and no blame. Cause I'm forgiven in your name. Praise you, Lord. We're gonna do something a little bit right now. We're going to play a video because we're celebrating this as our Yom Yerushalayim Shabbat. And so we're going to play the music video for Jerusalem and some beautiful pictures of the city and just knowing how God is able to forgive our people and to set us into a large place. He made a promise. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the message. Yeshua, over 2,000 years ago, prophesied the destruction and the restoration of Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Shalom Yerushalayim Shalom Shalom Yerushalayim Pray for the peace of Jerusalem Pray for God's peace over all of them. May they prosper who love you. May God's peace be within your walls. And he will give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for all the sadness. He'll bring them garments of praise for all the tattered and the torn. Yes, he will give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for all the sadness. He'll bring them garments of praise to heal the weary and the worn. May his peace be within their walls. For over 3,000 years, we have looked to this city dispersed throughout the earth you now have brought us home again we will never keep silent just like the watchmen on the wall till Jerusalem is established as a praise in all the earth 
Yes, we will give our eyes no sleep and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem so that all the world is blessed. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for God's peace over all of them. May they prosper who love you. May God's peace be within your walls. Cause God has brought us beauty out of ashes. The oil of joy to soothe all sadness. He brought us garments of praise for all the tattered and the torn. Yes, you have brought us beauty out of the ashes. The oil of joy to soothe all our sadness. You brought us garments of praise to clothe all the weary and the worn. May God's peace be within our walls. Shalom, shalom Yerushalayim. Shalom, shalom Yerushalayim. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim. Baruch Hashem. It's an amazing thing that God has done in restoring our land, restoring our city, restoring our people. And God, it's just his way of doing things to restore. That's what he does. And that is why there is none like our God. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion, to our service uh, here at Hope Cathedral. And uh, we also appreciate all those watching on the broadcast as well. And we're glad you decided to join us. And our calling as a congregation is to declare a Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. It's important to understand context. And that's really what we are looking to do. But not just from an academic standpoint. God wants our hearts to be warmed by the power of his presence. He wants us to be demonstrating his love to all those around us. And when we share his truth... When we share him as the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, he opens up for us a door of opportunity for us and for everyone we come in contact with so that we begin to be extensions of his love to those around us. And it doesn't matter if they always are receptive to what we're presenting in love. I mean, after all, Yeshua on the execution stake said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And listen, people may think they know what they're doing, but they really don't. When it comes to the things of God, he can set them free and be able to open up his plan of restoration for them. And that's what we want to share. That's what we're trying to share because this is a Jewish message for the whole world. It says, in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God's desire is that no one would perish, but all would come to life in him. Now, we have a decision to make. And we want to pray that God will open up people's hearts and that they'll respond to that message of life and be set free. And this is what we're here for, to reach Jewish and non-Jewish people with this Jewish message for the whole world. It's an amazing history that God has laid out. And all through it, we see the thumbprint, we see the sign-off signature of God in each place as he approved each stage and opened for us the door into his presence, into the very holy of holies, where we are seated in heavenly places with Messiah. And this is our desire to see him go forth and the message that can set people free throughout this region and throughout this earth. People need the Lord and he is there for them, to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart and I will be found of you. That's God's 
heart for everyone. So I encourage you to do that and to give your heart to him and let him change where you are from the inside out. Avinu Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for this time to come into your word. We ask you to open our hearts to hear what your Ruach, what your Spirit would say to us. You can take the same message and speak something nuanced and different to each one, but Lord, speak to us. We're here not to hear, people not here to hear me. We're here to hear from you. And Lord, your words can transform our lives. And that's what we're looking for. To be bound up in your presence and see you do exploits in our midst. We thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Today is our Yom Yerushalayim Shabbat service. And the title for this message today is Ascending and Descending. And I want to look at some numbers, mostly the number 40 and the number 50. Maybe seven will throw in there too. But I want to mention this because within the framework of the reading today, the Torah portion and even last week's portion, these things come into mind. They come very strongly. We saw last week in Vayikra in Leviticus 23, it talked about the festivals and it talked about the counting of the Omer. We are today in day 41. Yesterday was day 40 and that's an important day. We're going to talk about that as well. Because there was something very special that happened in that time. We see the counting of the Omer as they're anticipating the next harvest. It's an agricultural festival. But there's a lot of things tied in with that. We're going to talk about the details of that next week when we talk about Shavuot. But I want to talk about some of these things because they set up a pattern that is there in the scripture that is very powerful. One of the things that we see is God's desire to bring his presence into our lives. Now, in this chapter, I mentioned before that last week we spoke about the 50 days leading up to Shavuot. It was an anticipation. Yeshua's disciples during that time had some very interesting things happen. We're going to look at some of that because it's a very special time. We often hear that with Shavuot, we speak about the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law. But it was more than that. There was God manifesting himself to his people. And there was something of an expansion, speaking to Moses, but now speaking to the people. And in this chapter, or in this section this week, uh, it talks about from the mountain God spoke. And it also talks about the year of Jubilee, the 50th year, in which all of those who lost their properties, who had to sell themselves into servitude, would have these things restored back again. And it's a picture of the way God wants to restore all of us. The way he wants to bring these things back. And there was also working through history very few times when you ever saw anything referenced to where people actually followed this through. But the value, as you look through chapter 25, the value and 26, when you look at of, of Vayikra of Leviticus, when you look through this, you begin to see that God's purpose was almost like his safety net. It was like the biblical welfare system. It wasn't like you acquired the land and you built condominiums and shopping centers on it. The value of the land was the yield of its fields, what it would produce. And so the value of that land was also based on how many years were left before it would revert back to the original owner and the original family. And through all of this, God was trying to show us that we are our neighbor's keeper, that we are our brother's keeper, that we are one family, one people, 
that we care for one another and we don't look to try to acquire just to have. We've seen so many times people trying to acquire just to hold power over others, to control others. But God's desire is to open up opportunity for people. And it's an amazing thing to look at. The year of Jubilee is a release time. It's a new starting point. It's, a, it's sort of like a restart button that God opens up. And people would then come back and begin to work their fields again. So if somebody failed in some manner and lost everything, there was a future and a hope for them and their family and those that followed because it would revert back. And the value of the land was what the land produced. That's important because sometimes people think if we acquire something, the more we acquire, the more important we are. The fact is, what we do with what we have is more important than how much we have. And we need to be able to yield ourselves to God. And this was the whole point. They were to yield themselves to the Lord. You know, it mentions in here also about the Shemitah when it talked about the seventh year when they would leave their fields and not allow them to grow crops. And then they would work the field the next day. And so it was the third year they would come back and work that and have harvest. And God provided for them in that year before the rest enough to supply to be able to carry them through to the time when they would plant again and have harvest. And this whole idea of harvest is important because when Yeshua was going through his situation with his disciples, there is something in the book of Acts, in Acts 1, that we see. And there are a couple of references that I want to make to this because there was an ascension that took place. If you know the New Covenant, in Acts 1, you see him ascending. And what you see is him going up into the clouds. And let me just read a little bit of this to you. In Acts 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, After his death, he showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, they saw him, and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. He spoke with them about the kingdom of God, but it says he was with them 40 days. It was during that 40-day period. Yesterday in the county of the Omer was day 40. It was the day that this all took place in the Jewish calendar. He was with them, and on that day, that time of sharing. In one sense, you could see a correlation, too, between what was happening to Moses on the mountain during 40 days and 40 nights, and God was opening up to him the revelation of what he was going to impart to the people as they would walk in obedience to him. And so he was being downloaded with all of this information, all of this understanding, all of the design of the tabernacle, all of these things. Couldn't wait to get back and tell the people. And what happened when he came back? They had built a golden calf. They already abandoned the one who shared and gave the Torah. You know, it's funny. They say it was the giving of the Torah. So some might say, well, they didn't have the Torah yet, so how would they know? Because what we read before Moses went into the mountain is that he imparted to them all of these stipulations, all of these things, all of the elements of the Ten Commandments and other elements that were brought out before he went into the mountain. One of which was, do not make idols of gold. <laughs> do not make idols. And so they couldn't even keep that small bit. So we celebrate within traditional Judaism the giving of the Torah. And in reality, it was the giving of the Torah, but it was during the time period that our people actively rebelled against the Torah. So there is something about not just having, I said before, not just what you have, what you do with what you have. And so God was imparting to Moses his plan for the people. What we see with Yeshua is that he, during the 40 days that he was with his disciples, after his resurrection, he is imparting to them an understanding of the scriptures. Remember in Luke, when he was going and those people were with him and, and 
they, they were listening to what he was saying and they were all depressed because the one who they thought was Messiah was now dead and that's the end of it. And he said, and he spoke with them and then when he broke bread and gave blessing, he disappeared and they said, they realized it was Messiah and they said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke? As he went through, he showed throughout the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, the message. You know, they didn't have the New Testament there. He didn't quote from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He didn't quote from Paul. He didn't quote from any of them because those things weren't written yet. But he was sharing with them through the prophets and through the writings and through the Torah all of the things that God's plan of redemption represented for them and for generations to come. It was also there for the Jewish people, but later it would open up for the non-Jewish people as well because God's plan was that way from the beginning. But here during this time, this 40-day period, he was imparting to them all of this understanding. But it's sort of like when you see a, a, a nuclear reactor. Everything, nothing happens until it reaches what's called critical mass. And all of the stuff being poured into his disciples were more words and more actions, more things. But the reality of it was when he said to them, wait in Jerusalem. I mentioned before, he says, after the, his death, he showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He was not only alive, but he gave convincing proofs of the messianic prophecies that were all a part of the plan of God. And he was laying this out for them. It says, during a period of 40 days, they saw him and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. He wasn't talking just about history. He was talking about allowing the king to reign so that the kingdom of God, which he kept saying is among you, within you, would be made manifest to the world around them. It says, at one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard about for me. For Yohanan, John used to immerse people in water. But in a few days, you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. When they were together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? They were still thinking in a natural way, thinking about the deliverance that came through the Maccabees over the oppressors that were holding them captive in their land. And they were hoping that he would be the one to deliver them from Rome. But there was something more. They were still thinking about these things. And they looked around and they wondered about how amazing it was. Will he restore it? He answered, you don't need to know the dates or the times. The Father has kept these under his own authority. But you will receive power. When the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you, you will be my witnesses both in Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, in all Yehuda, Judah, and Shomrom, Samaria, indeed to the ends of the earth. He was giving them a broad vision of what he was imparting to them would produce as they would experience the immersion of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit in their life. They weren't sure what that was going to look like or how that was going to take place. And we'll be talking a little bit about that next week. After saying this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they were staring into the sky after him, suddenly they saw two men dressed in white standing next to them. The men said, What's wrong, sir? What's wrong with you? He says, you Galileans, why are you standing, staring into space? I just saw him ascending. That would be something you'd want to pay attention to. Today, everybody would pull out their iPhones, and they would be <laughs> recording this. Look at him going. Wow, is he going? Wow, that's amazing. Are there any wires? No, it's just, are there any, what, how is he doing that? <laughs> but he says, why are you staring? Why are you staring into space, standing there? This Yeshua, who has been taken away, he was ascending, will come back to you in just the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He will descend. There is something about 
him ascending and descending that is so important. And we're going to look at a number of things with this. Then they return the Shabbat walking distance from the Mount of Olives in Yerushalayim. After entering the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. And it gives the disciples and what they were doing there. It was here that they were preparing for what was going to happen with Shavuot. They didn't know what to expect. But you see, when God makes a promise, he fulfills that promise, whether we understand it or not. When he said Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles has run its course, he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the restoration that we saw happen 53 years ago, or 52 years ago, recent history. It was a miracle, and it was a promise that was made over 2,000 years ago. And here we are, seeing the fulfillment of this today. It tells us that God is faithful to do what he says he will do. And that's important. He told the disciples, you're going to be filled with power and that you should go into all the world and preach the good news to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. This was an amazing calling, and we are all a part of that legacy. We are all a part of those who have heard the call, and at the same time, it's not just to come to know him, but to be able to get to know him in such a way that we can introduce others to him as well. And so during that 40-day period, there was another 40-day period. Remember when Yeshua had been immersed by Yohanan, by John, and he went driven by the Lord into the wilderness for 40 days. And what he did in that 40 days of challenge and being, being tempted by the adversary and not yielding, but always yielding to the word of God, he came through victoriously during that 40-day period and entered into his ministry in the same way that Israel for 40 years could not enter into the land. He fulfilled what Israel could not fulfill. And he did it for Israel and for the nations. And so we see again this period of 40 days where God was speaking to us. You know, one of the things that we do during from Passover to Shavuot is to count the Omer, to count the grain, and to count down to the time of expectation for a new harvest. And so what we should do, just like most of the Jewish holidays, there is a reflective period prior to each holiday. There is the removing of the chumets before Passover. There is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the 10 days of awe. Before that, before Sukkot. Before that, there were the seven weeks of Isaiah, speaking of Messiah and all of this. He is constantly wanting us to take record of where we stand and open our hearts to receive the fullness of what he wants to do. He wants to descend upon us so that we can ascend into the very holy of holies where we are seated with Messiah in heavenly places. It doesn't mean we're walking around in a daze, but it means that we have been seated by Messiah's purchase of our redemption by his death and resurrection. He has given us access to the very presence of God. And then what do we do with that? It doesn't mean you just accept the Lord and then you go to heaven. Heaven descends upon us. The kingdom of God is within you, he said. But the kingdom of God is established wherever we allow the king to reign. It isn't just an arbitrary thing saying, and now... The kingdom of God has arrived. Wow, let's have a parade. What is it about the kingdom of God? You can look at the details of what is described in Yeshua related to them, all these things about the kingdom. But the most important aspect of the kingdom of God is that we allow the king to reign. If he is reigning, then we're able to walk in everything we do, in union with him. And in union with him, we have access to everything that God has made available to us. Great and precious promises. All of these things are a part of that. 
We also see that God gave the Great Commission not to go out in your own strength and in your own power. But when you've received that dunamis power of God to come upon us, He will empower us to be able to, to speak forth. I almost couldn't speak forth just now. I have to speak fifth. No. You speak forth. You know, he told them also, you're going to go before rulers and before others, and don't worry about what you're going to say. God will give you what you need to know, and you'll speak on his behalf. And it worked too, because when they went before the Sanhedrin, and when they stood there, they took note that they had been with Yeshua. Not just those 40 days. But they had been with Yeshua as his disciples, and most of the time, their reaction to what he taught was that they had no clue what he was talking about. But it didn't matter because as they spent time with him, he was imparting to them his very essence. And when the outpouring of the Spirit took place on Shavuot, it was a complete saturation. And when they spoke, they didn't speak in their own words. They didn't speak in their own resumes. They spoke as an oracle of God. They spoke in the power of His Spirit. They spoke as an extension of Yeshua through the power of His Spirit. And they spoke with authority, not because they were confident in their ability, but because they understood the reality that the King is here. The King of the Jews. The King, the Savior for the whole world is present and we are here representing his kingdom. And they could speak with authority because they had been with Yeshua. And that's the thing they noticed. They took note that they had been with Yeshua. And what does that mean? They saw the same authority, not just in one man, but now in those who are his disciples. And the kingdom of God was sweeping across that. The power of God was reaching people's hearts because there was a message of harvest that was coming. And so during that time of Shavuot, they're praying for a harvest and thousands of people, thousands of men and their families came to the Lord that day because there was an outpouring of God's spirit. I've said this too. I don't want to get too much into next week, but Peter didn't prepare a message. He didn't prepare and ask permission to go and speak there. But God's spirit made a way for him because what was imparted to him was an unction of God's spirit that opened up and God had the lights on, the power of God, spotlight was on the disciples and everybody turned to look and see what was happening. And Peter stood and said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And he went on to do all of this. And he shared powerfully. And thousands responded. It was like a harvest. And isn't that what Yeshua said? That the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We need to align ourselves not just as laborers to do tasks, but align ourselves under the alliance and allegiance to the king of the kingdom that is here. And as we yield ourselves to him, he opens up opportunity for us to speak beyond ourselves. And when that happens, heaven descends upon us. There's another interesting passage. You know, we talk about Yom Yerushalayim. And it says in Isaiah, do not keep silent. For Zion's sake, do not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, do not hold back. And what does he say? He's going to pour his spirit out. And what he says also is that there are watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. And they will not tire day and night. They are crying out, interceding in prayer, watching. You know, a watchman doesn't mean you just watch. You can say, did you see what happened? Yeah, I saw it. You know, you watch today. People are watchmen. They pull out their cell phones. Somebody's getting beaten up. And they pull out their cell phones to get a record of it and hope they get a, a, a lot of hits on their uh, YouTube or something. Instead of stepping in to address somebody who is being beaten. 
They'd rather observe and watch. But when God says, I've set you as watchmen on the walls, a watchman had responsibility. The responsibility was that he had to declare and send forth the alarm to the people. If he sent forth the alarm to the people and they did not respond, the blood was not on his hands. But if he neglected his responsibility to speak forth when that attack was coming, there might be a slaughter and their blood would be upon his hands. Because he didn't do what a watchman was supposed to do. A watchman is to watch to then take action that he's been prepared to address and reach and warn the people. We are here in a time when God wants to bring deliverance. You know, the idea of God making Jerusalem to be his habitation, to be his place. When Solomon said, if we, when we go astray and we go and are put into captivity, how do you pray that at a time when you just finished the temple and everything is so grand and wonderful that you ask God, that was the prelude to his response in 2 Chronicles 7.14. He said, when we go astray and are brought into captivity, if we look to this place, to Jerusalem, will you hear and will you answer? And that's when God said, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. That's his heart towards us. We want our nation to be delivered. We want to see changes happen. But if all we do is stand as observers and say, ah, it's really a shame. I can't believe it. The whole country is going down the tubes. What can you do about it? It's a real shame, isn't it? That's not a watchman. That's an observer. But God wants us to stand in the gap. He wants us to understand that we have a responsibility. If we're called by his name, it's not enough to say, let's make business cards and say, yes, I'm called by his name. Are you a member too? Membership has privileges. That's not what he's talking about. We do have privileges. But the privilege to be able to also go to the lost, to go to those who are bound to those who are enslaved by all kinds of things and declare the kingdom of God is here to let them know that they are deeply loved and that God has made provision to set them free. If we don't speak forth, the blood is on our hands. He doesn't say to go to the politician and get them to pass all the legislation that we think is important. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. doesn't mean you go and say, you know, you need to humble yourself. You need to go out there and humble yourself. You're too proud. Look to yourself first. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt us in due time and in the proper balance. But he says, if you call upon my name, humble yourselves and pray and seek my face Turn from your wicked ways. There is a list of things that he told them to do. He didn't just say, Solomon said, when we go astray, if we look to this place, will you deliver us and bring us back? He said, okay, here are the steps. If you're called by my name, humble yourself. Seek my face. Turn from wicked ways. He's going through a list of things that if they will follow that pattern, God will do, just like he said throughout the scriptures, he will bring his kingdom to descend upon them. You know, it's funny, it says that in the same way that he was taken up, he will return again. Now, everybody wants to think in terms of the eschatology, and they want to watch for um, satellites that are telling us there's a cloud of things. It looks like a guy on a white horse. Somebody is coming in from outer space. It isn't looking just to some manifestation. It is also looking to the kingdom of God coming in power. And you know what's interesting? People always talk about heaven as the pearly gates, streets of gold, right? But you know what it says in that passage in Revelation? Right before this beautiful description of Jerusalem descending? Jerusalem descending. Do you know what it says about it? It says, I'm going to show you the bride. 
And then he sees Jerusalem descending. He was speaking of the bride of Messiah, the body of believers, in architectural terms. And it was a description of the perfect balance of his people doing what they're supposed to do. It was Jerusalem descending. It was God making his home, not in a geographic space, although he is very clear about the importance of the geographic space. But we become the tabernacle of God. We become the temple of God. We become a part of that new Jerusalem descending. And when we do that, I think also of the beautiful illustrations we saw when Jacob was leaving his land and he saw angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And in one sense, we have to always be ascending and descending, opening our hearts to the one who is supreme, and allowing our hearts to be humbled before him, recognizing his authority, his power, his kingship. And when we do all of these amazing things that God wants to do, it isn't just simply, well, he told us the Great Commission, so let's go out and do it. I've got some real good plans here, and I think if we can do it by 1987, we can have it done. Remember all those different things people said? That if we can have one person reach one person and everybody, did, and they had a plan to make it all, that by, you know, a couple times before the, in the 1980s, we could reach every single person on the planet. And then Yeshua can return. Or they said in 2000. And it's like they had all these dates in mind because they thought they had a plan that could reach every person on the planet. But it isn't trying to reach every person on the planet. If God can reach us and can transform us, then as an organic move of God's Spirit, we begin to reflect His life in us. And they take note. Not, wow, you're really smart. Boy, you're pretty brilliant. Oh, you write real well. You do. No. They look and they said, there's something about you that's different. You've been with Yeshua, haven't you? Because his presence is all over you. There is something they say, I don't know what it is, but I want in. There's something about when his spirit descends upon us. And we ascend into the heavenlies with him. And are seated in heavenly places in him. And we manifest the presence of God to those who are in darkness and have no light. He brings revelation in life. We have responsibility, not just to wait for some cube to fall from the sky, but to allow our hearts to be humbled before the Lord as we descend in humility and rise in the empowerment of his spirit. And we see God doing exploits in our midst. Everything we see, and I said this over, we get tired of me saying it. But looking through the New Covenant and all of the letters that were written over and over again, especially with Paul, but over and over again, we see references that say, in union with Messiah, this, 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 and this. In union with Messiah, in union with Him, in everything we have. And so if that's the case, let's focus on our union with Him not on some outside issue. If we are doing what we're called to do, the outside issues as distractions will not keep us from focusing on what we need to do. See, if we focus too much on all of the outside activities, we can easily be drawn into being sidetracked, and as they say in sports, being benched, because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We're forgetting the fundamentals. And the fundamental is that I want to walk in the midst of you. I want to be your God and you to be my people. God made it very clear what his focus is. He says, they'll know you're my disciples by all of the storefronts you open up, by all of the opportunities you provide, by all of the amazing giftings that you have. He doesn't say that. He said, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. They'll know you're my disciples. And he says, love in the same way that I have loved you. How do we do that? We don't just try to imitate him. 
we allow him to take residence in us. And when he does, and his spirit descends upon us, we ascend into a place and a realm where he is reigning, and his message and his power goes forth, and people respond to Messiah being lifted up in our lives. You know, I thought about this the other day. We were, they had the National Day of Prayer on Thursday. That was day 39, right before the 40th day. And I was thinking that here around the country, you had people crying out to God for deliverance, for healing of our nation, quoting that passage from 2 Chronicles 7.14. All of these things, they're crying out. They're doing what he said to do if my people who were called by my name. But it doesn't end with a day of prayer and said, well, that was great. Next year, let's do this again. But you know what? It's not next year. It's the next day. It's the next moment. It's the next opportunity that God has given us to allow his spirit to reign. And if we just think because we got together and prayed that we covered ourselves and we'll meet again next year, it's anemic. You may have a wonderful prayer time, but it's moment by moment, day by day, that we immerse ourselves in him that makes the difference, that imprints in us the very presence of Yeshua having residence within us. And don't be fooled to think that because people say wonderful things about you, that you're wonderful. Now, in God's eyes, you're the apple of his eye. But when we look to establish our credentials based on what we appear to be to people, those same people that will put you up on a pedestal will, without hesitation, take you down. But you know what? A friend of ours used to say, stay close to the wall, speaking about the wailing wall, prayer. And I used to say to him, I said, you know what? I have a different approach. I say, stay close to the floor. Because if you fall, it's not going to hurt so bad. And if you fall, it's not a big drop. Stay close to the floor. Stay close to the place where you walk with humility before God, not just in a physical action, but where you are humbling yourself and recognizing every day that the accolades all belong to him, not to us. And the accolade that we have, the place that we have, is being able to be used by God to do things that we in our own strength and power could never accomplish. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, he lets me come along for the ride. And then he asks me to do something in the midst of that, and results happen. Not because of me, not because of you, but because of him and God's ability to help us yield ourselves to him in the way that he talks about. I remember, I've said this before, there was a woman we used to listen to and read some of her stuff in, in Bible school. And she said, when Yeshua first set souls to loving him, he wants them to see him all the time. And if they're very much in earnest, they live that way, moment by moment, moment by moment. You know, they say of humility, it's that little something you lose the moment you discover you found it. You found it. You say, wow, that was really humble of me. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't think anybody has been quite as humble as I was. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're proud of your humility. We need to immerse ourselves in him so that we could experience all of the grandeur of what God wants to do. And it comes because we never look to take the glory, but give it all back to him. And the nice thing about it, too, is how many have ever had times where that you're going through, and you, you don't have a clue of what's going on? Did you ever have that experience? I mean, every day we have that experience, don't we? You know what's great about it? God doesn't require us to understand every detail. Now, we may say, God, I, I need to know before I go exactly what's going to happen. But you know, in life, it doesn't work that way. You plan, God laughs. You plan, and then life happens. Things change. And we adjust, and we move. 
But what we find is that as we are yielded to Him, we move in a way that opens up doors that we were not able to open up ourselves. And we see God do things that we never imagined we could be participants in. So we never lay claim to the things that are accomplished. We only lay claim to Him. And when we do that, He opens up doors for us beyond our imagination, beyond our expectation, beyond anything of the best we could ever be. He makes us more. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you as we celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, the day of Jerusalem. We celebrate more than just the city. We celebrate more than just a place. We celebrate the fact that you marked that place thousands of years ago and said, you're going to call this your home. And you're going to have everyone focus and see this place as a pivot point of all history and of your ultimate plan. But as Yeshua ascended, we are looking for him to descend once again. The, the return of Messiah. But before the return of Messiah coming in the clouds, Lord, you want us to return to you and have you return to us and descend upon us in a way that can be like a nuclear explosion of life, reaching that critical mass and power goes forth because we yield ourselves to you. We never own it, but we're owned by you. And Lord, we ask you to open up our hearts to be able to experience that and to be a part of the body of Messiah, of the bride of the Lamb, of Jerusalem descending, and letting your presence and your reality go forth. Delivering and setting people free from all the things that bind them. Healing and deliverance, Lord. Restoration and not destruction. We thank you, O oh God, for all of your provisions. For Messiah, for Yeshua coming and humbling himself to become as one of us. And then humbling himself to the point of death when he wasn't guilty. And then raising from the dead so he could set at liberty all of us who have been bound. What an amazing thing you've done. And then you said you'll receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you. Lord, help us to walk in your Spirit and to do and be led by your Spirit. And be always in deep union with you. And let the hallmark of our walk be demonstrated by the love that we have for one another. We thank you, Lord. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's all stand. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel. So we bless one another with these words. Yair Adonai Panavelecho Vekunecho Yisa Adonai Panavelecho Veyosem Lecho Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agree by saying amen and amen. Shabbat Shalom, we'll see you in shul. Come visit us on Saturday in Jackson and watch us and share the broadcast with others as well. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Shalom.